met when um, we were postdocing in Melanie's in Melanie Cooper groups uh, in Michigan State, and I believe Melanie is on the call. So hello to you, Melanie. Um, Ryan is interested in advancing, I suppose, beyond the deficit model that does kind of characterize what thing uh, the types of things that kids can do towards creating environments that will really help them to use what they know um, to make sense of the world around them. So today, um, Ryan is going to be sharing some thoughts on cognition and its role in assessment, which chimes really nicely um, following on from Nicole's wonderful presentation. So Ryan, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to ask you to share your screen and take things away. That's perfect. There we go. Um, thank you very much, Ash and, and Michael, for putting together this fantastic uh, space for the chemistry education community to, to come together. I'm continually amazed by how collaborative and thoughtful this community is, as evidenced by this, this wonderful series of MICER symposia. I'm going to talk about assessments, which shouldn't surprise anyone at this point in the game. Um, and my initial title made reference to this assessment triangle, and I'll talk about it briefly, but I thought, well, that might be a construct that's somewhat um, unfamiliar to many in the audience. And so what we're really going to focus on here today is how our assumptions about learning help guide what we consider reasonable to infer from what students write. As I'm sure uh, is well known in this audience, assessment is immensely complex. We cannot read minds. If we can read minds, or if you can read minds, and you would like a job, please contact me, uh, because that would be great. We can use your very special set of skills, um, but, but I can't read minds. And so we have to really engage in this process of argument from evidence to infer what students know and can do. And I hope to engage all of you in a couple of thought experiments where I will propose some assumptions about learning and then give you some data to consider and help you see how those assumptions shape what you consider as reasonable inferences. Like Katie earlier today, I really like Stacy's practice of putting the acknowledgments first because often they get rushed if they're at the end. Uh, so the data that I'll be presenting is in large part the work of Kara. Uh, who together with Danny Chavez, who's on the top left, went through a lot of data analysis as part of a large cross-sectional study of general chemistry learning environments uh, that I'm working on together with Nicole Becker's group. We're not going to talk a whole lot about this study, but the analysis presented was almost entirely the work of those two. The rest of my group who was pictured on this slide also have been fantastic in thinking about chemistry, chemistry learning environments, and the nature of assessment. So thanks to all of you. I'm going to kick things off with a quote by a person who I don't think has ever been quoted in Meiser. Melanie likes this quote, so I'm, she may have put it somewhere, but I don't know if it was in Meiser. Um, George W. Bush actually said this. I looked up the video. I think in ChemEd research, we ask this question pretty frequently. It's possible in some spaces it isn't asked as much. But this notion of our students progressing towards the performances that we value is at the core of a great amount of what we do as chemed researchers and as educators. So I might reframe George W. Bush's quote in this sort of way. How will we know that students are progressing towards the goals we value? This too is a massively complex sort of question, and I'm going to drill down into a couple parts of it before we begin our, our thought experiment. So we first need to think about what are the goals we value? So if we want to, to write something that has the potential of eliciting evidence that students can engage in the performances we care about, we need to define what those are. This is pretty non-trivial. Um, I would argue sort of globally that making sense of phenomena in terms of atomic molecular behavior is the intellectual core of chemistry and should be the intellectual core of chemistry learning environment. We all know the tremendous power of atomic molecular models to make sense of things that you can't make sense of in any other way, to predict the outcomes of systems that can be biased to produce all sorts of things of value to both the chemistry community and the world at large. And so I would argue this sort of umbrella of sense-making 
is where we want students to be developing competency. But that too is pretty vague. I'm gonna specify a phenomenon for our thought experiment today. This is our phenomenon for the day. I'm told this is lithium chloride by Google. So we're gonna go with it. If you take lithium chloride and you dissolve it in a beaker of water, you will notice that your beaker gets warm. This is a fun demo that's in many high school and college curricula because you are all chemists. When I say this, you are probably instantly calling to mind the notion that you have an ionic lattice where the cations and anions are held together by electrostatic attraction. And as you add that to water, energy is being transferred into that lattice to disrupt those ion-ion attractions. And at the same time, new attractive interactions are being formed between the ions and the water molecules until the cations and anions are wholly solvated. Many of you are probably also thinking, oh, the beaker got warm. That's cool. That means that the interactions formed are stronger than the interactions broken because formation of electrostatic attractions releases energy and breakage of these requires energy. That's kind of an elegant sort of demonstration to get a lot of, at a lot of the big ideas in chemistry. So that's our phenomenon. We should probably specify exactly what we want students to know and be able to do with regard to that phenomenon. If I don't cite the framework for K-12 science education and everything that I do, I turn into a pumpkin. So that's going to be the next slide. Um, for our thought experiment today, I will argue that we want students to develop and use a model that is a simplified system representation that allows us to predict or explain something. And we want them to as they're developing and using this model, be weaving together ideas related to the energetics of forming and breaking electrostatic attractions, as, and, and then to think about energy flow from system to surroundings, to actually make sense of the fact that your beaker gets warm when you add lithium chloride to water. So let's say we want to get evidence that students can engage with this sort of a performance. We can then think about what students could do that would be convincing to us that they can weave together big ideas regarding electrostatics and energy to make sense of this phenomenon. Maybe they can draw a representation. They can show the sort of undissolved ionic lattice, the process of dissolution, and then the, the final dissolved system in which you can't have cations and anions wholly solvated. Maybe they can explain that in words. Maybe they can then talk about the energetics. Oscar knows where I'm going. I thought he was on here. He spent a lot of time thinking about this. Then we can think about what tasks have the potential to elicit this evidence. Um, Oscar Judd spent a fair amount of time at Michigan State University thinking about this prompt. And I think it very well aligns with that performance expectation that I gave earlier. So this will be the prompt that is eliciting student response evidence that we'll be focusing on for the duration of my talk. Oscar discovered that when he asked students to draw the process of dissolution, student responses improved when they were explicitly prompted to draw snapshots in time. The, the sort of undissolved solute, the process of dissolving, and then finally the dissolved solute. In Oscar's prompt, students were then asked to describe the process that they just drew. So what do they think is going on there? And finally, they were to bring in these ideas of energetics to think about why the beaker got warm. So far, we've been talking about assessment as a process of reasoning from the things that students write to infer what they know and can do. So we've talked about observation. These are student responses to the tasks that we give them. We've talked a little bit or at least we've thought in general terms about interpretation. So what sorts of things could students write that would convey to you that they understand how and why this phenomenon is happening? That's this inferential process. Both of these are powerfully impacted by the assumptions that we make about learning. This is the assessment triangle I was referencing in the older version of my talk title. The assumptions that we make about learning powerfully affect the inferences that we consider reasonable. I recognize that that sentence is a mouthful and that a lot of research on conceptual change is super duper dense. And so that's why we're going to do a thought experiment on it. So what I'm going to try to engage all of you in 
is a process of inferring things about student understanding from things that they wrote to parts of that prompt I displayed earlier. And I'm gonna give you an assumption about learning to keep in the back of your mind when you're inferring. I want you to start by assuming that students have a more or less coherent and stable theory-like understanding of the world. And that in many ways that theory-like understanding is similar to scientific theories. It's consistent with observation. Um, it's more or less internally consistent. It helps you make sense of things that you experience. The stability is the key part here because I want you to assume that students are gonna draw on this fairly coherent construct whenever you ask them a question. And so this construct is not context dependent. There are a lot of people who've written about this in various sorts of ways. Um, there's a great summary of this in the Andy DeSessa Cambridge Handbook chapter I put at the bottom of the slide if you're interested. I will, as a disclaimer, tell you that Andy DeSessa definitely has a horse in this race. So read that um, with some acknowledgement of his biases. One of the more famous ways that it has been argued that students can sort of change these uh, fairly meaty conceptions is for a scenario to occur in which the inadequacy of their existing conception is laid bare. So it doesn't make sense of something they're experiencing. And then they know that there's another option that will allow them to make sense of this thing. And so they sort of swap it out. This is kind of how Strike and Posner's 1982 paper on conceptual change was taken up. They published a later paper that, it, that indicated maybe that's not how they wanted it to be taken up, but that's kind of how it was taken up by a lot of people. So I'm not advocating for this, but what I'm doing is asking you, when we look at a, a few examples of student response evidence, to imagine that students possess these more or less coherent and stable theories about the way the world works, that they're drawing on as they select an answer or construct an answer or draw a thing. That's the thought experiment. Okay, now let's interpret some assessment evidence. Recall the first part of Oscar's prompt, where students are asked to depict the dissolution process of lithium chloride dissolving in water. This is the picture that you will be interpreting. So I'll give you just a moment to look at that and then I'll pop up the um, poll question and ask Michael to display the poll. Remember, you are assuming for the purposes of this interpretation that students have more or less coherent and stable naive theories. Okay, Michael, please display the poll. I changed these options at the last minute, which is why it says A, B, and C. So you'll have to read the slide. It will give you about 10 more seconds. I recognize that this is a really abbreviated time frame. So obviously it would be a more deliberative exercise if you were doing data analysis or even if you were grading a test. Okay, can we end the poll and display the results, please? Wonderful, thank you, Michael. So we can see that a good number of people picked options A and C, with C being the more common of those. And so, this is a claim about student understanding of the phenomenon in general. And I would agree that that is in keeping with the idea that students have a coherent theory-like understanding of the world that they're drawing on in this instance. Let's take a look at the second part of this prompt. So again, uh, recall that students were asked to refer to what they just drew and then to describe the sequence of events that happen when lithium chloride dissolves in water. I'll give you a moment to read that and then we will put up the poll. Okay, can we please display the poll? 
again, you're putting on your theory theory hat here, trying on this model of learning. Give you about 10 more seconds. Okay, can we please stop and share the poll? Thank you. So we can see that the sort of majority perspective here was that the student is connecting ideas related to interactions formed and broken in the moment. We're going to get to that perspective in just a bit, because I, I would argue that perspective is actually more consistent with a different model of learning. I'm not at this point trying to evaluate these different models. And in fact, I would argue there's a spectrum from sort of hardcore theory theory to a more knowledge and pieces role of or, or model of cognition. But the folks who selected B and C are making claims about student understanding of the phenomenon in general. And I would agree that that is consistent with students having a, a coherent view of the world that they're drawing upon when they answer this question. This is the closest I'm going to get to a mic drop. Those are from the same student. So recall one of the answers on the last slide was the student um, understands the role of solvent. And one of the answers in the prior slide was that the student doesn't understand the role of solvent. Um, now, the, the, the claim that the student doesn't understand the role of solvent was not a commonly selected one on the drawing slide, um, but it's kind of remarkable the differences between what the student wrote and what they drew. I think they're not wholly consistent with one another, and that's interesting. So to me, a natural progression from that sort of realization is this question of, do students have these sort of coherent wrong theories that they're drawing on when we ask them to make sense of phenomena in terms of atomic molecular behavior? There's quite a lot published on this, a ton in, in physics ed, which I'll reference on a later slide. I'm just gonna pick one study that I really enjoy. And this is a 2013 paper by Melanie Cooper and colleagues um, in which students were asked to think about which compound in a pair had the highest boiling point and why. So this is very much analogous in some ways to some of the questions Nicole had in her prior presentation, where students were asked to make a claim, in many cases they made the correct claim, and then they were asked to justify it, to further illumine how they were reasoning things through. So these pairings were intentionally chosen. In this case, you can see you have ethanol, which has a hydroxyl group, and ethane, which doesn't. The next pair is a couple of alcohols with one being larger than the other, having a higher molecular mass. And then finally, we have two compounds that have the same molar mass and the same chemical formula. What was observed in this study is that a single student, when asked to pick which compound among a pair had, had the highest boiling point and justify why, would very often give idiosyncratic reasoning that varied according to context. That's consistent with a model of cognition in which students are calling to mind and connecting small grain things in the moment. And that changing the context can lead to calling to mind different small grain things and connecting them in somewhat different ways. I've represented these with little cartoons on the right. And so each one of those circles is meant to represent a small grain knowledge element, we'll call them. There's a lot of different ways we can characterize these. Andy de Sessa characterized phenomenological primitives, which are strategies extrapolated from experience that get the job done a lot of the time in which to students are irreducible. The most famous of these is the P prim of more means more. More effort begets more result. That's great when you're moving a fridge. It can be less great sometimes um, when you're trying to think what has the higher boiling point, because the thing with the higher molecular weight does not always have the higher boiling point. These can also be ideas about the nature and appropriate use of knowledge. So someone sitting down taking a paper and pencil test may go, hey, this is school science time, man. I know that I need to give the vocab word. 
And they may have a different perspective if there's something they've experienced and they're not quite sure what's going on and they want to know. It's weird to them and they're not sure what's going on. That may lead them to activate different tools about the nature and appropriate use of knowledge. There are resources that are from formal schooling. And one of our big challenges in chemistry is that atomic molecular behavior is counterintuitive and weird. And so a lot of the tools that you need to make sense of these phenomena, you have to get from formal settings in one way or another. I've put a lot of papers on the bottom left, and I, they're all by David Hammer. <laughs> David Hammer's great. Um, that talk about this resources perspective on cognition. I would highly recommend that top one. Uh, and my, I know my slides will be shared um, after the talk. Maybe they're already being shared. Um, Oh, I forgot. I never said you can screen cap. Feel free to screen cap. Apologies for not mentioning that at the beginning, but of course, feel free. Um, so I would, I would recommend reading a subset or all of these papers if you're curious about this perspective on cognition. But I would argue um, Melanie and Leah and Sonia's findings in that 2013 study are consistent with this model because every time the context changed for many students, so too did the pattern of reasoning which is consistent with calling to mind and connecting small grain things in the moment. Here and on the last slide, more means more will get the job done if all you're looking for is the right claim. The thing with a higher molar mass does have the higher boiling point, but that's not why. Here, that won't work anymore. You get a blue circle because students had to call to mind something different. Students, uh, when they're given this pair of compounds to choose between either in interview settings or on a constructed response prompt, can say things like, the more symmetric will have the higher boiling point, things of that sort. So this is the other end of our spectrum of models of learning. We have this like strong coherence. Students have naive theories that are like scientist theories perspective on one end. And on the other end, we have this conceptual ecology perspective where students are calling to mind and connecting small grain knowledge elements in the moment to address what they think they're supposed to do. There's a whole lot of stuff in the middle that we don't have time to go into today. So we're going to look at a few more student responses, but now I want you to change your hat. Don't be thinking anymore that students have coherent and stable naive theories about the way the world works, but instead adopt this conceptual ecology resources perspective. This idea that students are calling to mind and connecting these small grain knowledge elements in the moment to do what they think they're supposed to do. That's the first part of Oscar's prompt, which we've already seen a couple of times. And there's the student response. Give you a moment to take a look at that and wonder some things. Okay. Michael, please display the poll. I'm also going to add that uh, in a practice talk, a wonderful postdoc in my group, Adam Schaefer, advised me to get rid of option D, which was I don't have enough evidence to draw a conclusion because everybody would pick that. And so I'm not asking that these be like really solid conclusions, but more which way are you tilted? Because I recognize this is one data point. We'll give you about 10 more seconds. Okay, please end and display the poll. The overwhelming favorite with 85% of the votes is response A. And I agree, I think that's very consistent with this conceptual ecology perspective on cognition. In the moment, in the context of this prompt, students thought they should depict something related to charges separating. That seems to be consistent. This is part two, where students are asked to describe the process that they just drew. I'll give you a moment to read that, and then we'll flash up the poll. <clears throat> 
Okay. Michael, please call up this last poll. Thank you. It will give about 10 more seconds. Okay, Michael, please um, stop and display the poll. So most people, 46% of people picked C. The idea that the student is connecting ideas related to interactions formed and broken uh, in the moment. Some of you might have been using that tried and true strategy of picking the longest answer, um, which I guess is okay. That works a lot of the time, right? That can be an intuitive resource. So I agree, that seems consistent. These other claims about students understanding this phenomenon in general terms, if you have a perspective that very often when students are writing down a response, they're calling to mind and connecting things in the moment. I would argue that part A or response A and B are, are difficult to justify from this one data point. You don't actually have evidence regarding um, how student understanding of this phenomenon might be altered by changing the way they're asked the question. And a study by, by Melanie Cooper related to acid-base understanding revealed that subtly changing the prompt structure can have pretty dramatic impacts on the sophistication of student answers. That finding too is consistent with the perspective that students are calling to mind and connecting small grain knowledge elements to do what they think they're supposed to do. Um, those two also are from the same student. That is less of a mic drop now because the context dependence of activating these resources is kind of why that theory is a thing. So um, it's not maybe quite as shocking, but kind of interesting nonetheless. So that's two students, <laughs> hardly anything we can generalize, but hopefully you found it a useful thought experiment. I want to turn now to our analysis of a larger population of students using responses to the same prompt. As I mentioned earlier, this is part of a, a larger cross-sectional study that I'm working on um, with Nicole Becker's group. And so the responses that you will be seeing will be uh, responses drawn from a larger data set with a random sample of 100 drawn from one of three different learning environments. So for part one, we are again asking students to draw the process of dissolution. Students might depict interactions breaking and forming when they do this, and we're viewing this as a process. So this is a very nice drawing in which we can see that students are depicting ion-ion attractions being disrupted, and solute solvent interactions being formed, and then we have the, the wholly dissolved um, cations and anions in the rightmost panel. So students that drew something in this vein would be described by the code breaking and forming. Students could draw something that only shows interactions breaking or forming. The most common response in this vein was students just drawing the ionic lattice breaking apart. They are depicting interactions being broken. As we saw in our two earlier examples, this drawing does not necessarily mean that those students do not understand the role of solvent. It may just mean that they didn't view that as important in their representation in the moment. Neither breaking nor forming would be a way to describe responses of this sort, where we can't really say anything about what the students are thinking in terms of interactions broken or formed. We wanted to see how student responses to the drawing related to student process descriptions. So we can code those in an analogous way. I'll give you a moment to read that. I've highlighted the bit of text that refers to interactions breaking and forming. Students could also mention either breaking or forming, not both. 
here we are coding the knowledge elements we have evidence students are activating. So the response does not have to be perfect. And so in this response, we are interpreting attach as formation of an interaction. And so this is coded as breaking or forming. And then in this case, the student didn't talk about interactions at all. And that was the sort of subset of knowledge elements we were interested in. And so this gets neither breaking nor forming. As I said, we are not trying to be overly evaluative with our coding assignment. So students can mention breaking or forming as well as breaking and forming without having a completely perfect response. As Ash mentioned earlier, my group really wants to foreground the tools that students bring to making atomic molecular sense of phenomena and try to frame learning environments as spaces where we can support all students in weaving these resources together to understand the power of atomic molecular ways of thinking. You're less concerned with stuff kids can't do. Okay, so what we can see from our Sankey diagram is that the vast majority of students who depicted a picture that indicated breaking and forming. Can you hear me still? I think my, okay, sorry, my, my ear, AirPods are making noises. They're kind of freaking out. Um, the vast majority of students who depicted interactions breaking and forming also um, wrote a process description that aligned with that, but not all. Some students wrote a process description um, that only referred to breaking or forming, and some didn't mention interactions at all. Let's think about this third part. This is the first time we've done this. But remember, our phenomenon is dissolving lithium chloride in water and noting that the beaker gets warm. So ultimately, we want to get back to that, right? We want to make sense of our phenomenon. So students can talk about the energetics of interactions breaking and forming. There's an example. As I'm sure many of you were thinking, the fact that the beaker got warm signifies that the interactions formed are stronger than the interactions broken because energy is released upon the formation of interactions. This is breaking or forming. Students are here only talking about interactions forming. And then finally, students could be referring to neither breaking nor forming. And so this is an example um, in which the student wasn't talking about interactions. Another way to get this code is to describe uh, the energetics um, backwards. So talk about energy being released when um, interactions are broken, for example. What we can see here is that only 49 students who drew, or rather who constructed process descriptions in which they described breaking and forming also invoked that the energetics of those processes in a, in a productive way from our perspective. Many students um, did not. Either they, they didn't talk about interactions or they described the energetics backwards. And then 21 students only talked about breaking or forming. I would submit that this is not very strong evidence that students have a coherent and stable idea that breaking interactions releases energy, if that was what they wrote. This is one moment in time, this is one assessment item, and I'm not overly confident on that conclusion from just this evidence. If we assume a resources perspective on cognition, we have an, an immensely complex task if we wish to characterize what students know and can do if they try to make sense of chemical phenomena. But we have to do that, right? We have to do that to know that we are supporting all students in these worthwhile goals. And so my question for you in the breakout rooms, if you know an easy solution to this, that would be great, but I, I don't know that one exists, is how can we elicit persuasive evidence if we adopt a resources perspective that students can explain how and why phenomena occur. How should we write these assessment items? How should we interpret that evidence? How frequently should they be administered? How should we vary their context? That's my question to all of you. So I would like um, breakout groups of four to six, please. 
All right, so the rooms are going to, the invitations are coming now. So for people in the, in the main room, if you're looking to get into the breakout room, there's a breakout room button on your screen. You may need to tap on the screen to see it. Uh, if you click on that, you'll be able to see the connection to rejoin your breakout room. So if anybody has difficulty joining the breakout room, you can just put a message in the chat or turn on your mic. So oh, I'm not too sure how long um, Brian was hoping. Sorry, say that again. I'm not too sure how long he was hoping to uh, to hold these breakout rooms. So I think we're probably looking to finish up in about six minutes, is it? Yeah. Has he gone to a breakout room? Yeah, I think so. I can't see. Let me see where he is. Uh, he's in number 16, so I can send you up 16 if you want. Um, I don't know, it's okay. Sure, I suppose, like, do you have a... You sure, know. go in the main room to prompt. Just checking to make sure nobody's on their own. That's breakout room. Really? Well, this is it now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought you said he. I'd say if you if you if you don't have a Zoom meeting for. <laughs> I'm having a student essentially a kind of a graduation ceremony on Zoom next week. Oh really? Yeah. No, so. Are you hosting? Yeah. At the university, are buying a Zoom lesson, but they haven't got it yet. I'll be back in just one second. Okay. 
Uh, so I just added you to room 16 there if you want to um, oh, yeah. wait and have a look at what are your plans. That's it, but two, well, we're just under two minutes left. Okay, perfect. I didn't know if I was supposed to join a breakout room, but it felt like it would be fun, so I did. Good. So I, they're just closing now, so I'm going to be back in just under a minute. Okay. And I guess, yeah, we don't really have time to respond in the chat too much, but there's also no easy answer to this, so I kind of thought it worthwhile just to mull it over. Yeah, that's fine. I'm great, Brian. I suppose I can share my screen and say if anybody solved this, mm -hmm. they can. So everybody is now back in the main room. Okay, so I know we don't have a, a huge amount of time, but if um, any group has a particular insight that they'd like to share in the chat, that would be fantastic. No, I'm not seeing anything. I, I think one of the really important take homes is that if we don't ask students how and why things happen, it's very problematic to assume that they are connecting the intellectual tools that we would deem productive from our perspective as chemists. Uh, and I think that also that thread um, went through Nicole's talk as well. If they simply select the appropriate claim, they could be doing so for the reasons that we would, um, or they could be stringing together knowledge elements related to symmetry or the bigger thing has got the more property or other sorts of things. And we just don't know if we don't have the potential to elicit that evidence. Very good point about how difficult it is to make a static assessment that uh, isn't interpretable in different ways. I think they're always gonna be interpreted in different ways, right? Students bring different lenses to everything they do. I think also consistent emphasis on how and why things happen in all parts of a learning environment is gonna be important. Uh, I think Melanie Cooper's done a lot of work on that. Uh, these are hard, these competencies. I mean, atomic molecular behavior is extremely counterintuitive. That phenomenon of exothermic dissolution is very complex. Um, and so students have never thought about how and why things happen from the perspective of atomic molecular behavior. That's gonna be a heavy lift. Yep, draw and explain, wonderful. Well, I suppose this probably brought up more questions than answers, but that was kind of the point. Um, 
I don't remember my Twitter handle. I think it's at RYN Stowe. I didn't put it on here, but um, feel free to send me an email if you'd like to chat more about this. That's my website. And uh, thank you all very much for participating. And thank you so much to Ash and Michael for putting this together. I mean, this is just fantastic. Thank you, Ryan. Right, that was that was really brilliant. It was really insightful, both from again from a methodology point.